there are entire games dedicated to stealth, both in the tabletop RPG world and in video games, where you get to play a thieves guild trying to one-up rival gangs or a bunch of fairies stealing data from cyberpunk megacorps. And these games do their job very well, but they are not what I want to talk about today. What I'm more interested in covering in this video is how do you handle stealth in a game like D&D or Pathfinder, action games where stealth is just one of many different types of encounters the system covers. You had a cool battle planned and your players decided to turn that into a stealth segment. How do you make that fun? How do you accommodate characters whose abilities weren't necessarily designed for stealth? How do you portray both combat and stealth as viable options without railroading your players into one or the other? There's some unique challenges and solutions that are very useful to know in these genre switching games. So let's get started. The first thing that's important to understand about stealth is what makes players choose a stealthy approach or a direct approach. If you don't have a good understanding of this, you might end up with what I like to call the Skyrim Stealth Archer Syndrome. One of Skyrim's most enduring memes is how everyone ends up playing a stealth archer, regardless of what character they were planning on making. Now here's the weird thing, Skyrim is the Viking inspired part of the Elder Scrolls setting, so pretty much the entire game was designed primarily for huge, loud, axe-wielding barbarians in mind. Stealth is something the game lets you do, but it feels like it's mostly here as an afterthought. Something that's here because it was present in previous games of the franchise. The melee combat includes a bunch of innovations from previous titles like shouts, dual wielding, perfect parries and a bunch more, but the stealth gameplay is pretty much a carbon copy of what you would find in Morrowind or Oblivion. It's not super engaging or fun and it's not what any of the marketing material for the game tried to sell you on. So why do players gravitate towards stealth gameplay so much in Skyrim? Well, players are simple creatures. They're always looking for the path of least resistance. So when you realize that fighting in melee would mean taking a bunch of hits and having to drink a bunch of precious healing potions to heal yourself, you very quickly realize that using your bow to one-shot every enemy without ever getting spotted, much less attacked or hit, would be less risky and less expensive. It's the path of least resistance. This pattern of behavior is something you can use as a game master. If you make sneaking more attractive than fighting, you get a stealth mission. You can do that in a couple of ways. The first is to have well Way more guards than the party can handle at once, but then you scatter those guards all around the place. So your players might be able to take out one group of guards, but if that group manages to call for reinforcements, it's bad news. Second, you can give your players a plot hook that will involve doing something illegal, like sneaking into a noble's mansion to prove they're corrupt. The noble might be weak enough that the party would win in a fair fight, but the noble, they'll have the full force of the law backing them up. On the flip side, if you make fighting more attractive than sneaking, you can nudge your players to take a more direct approach. That can be done in a couple of ways as well. One of them is to add a bunch of security measures that are easier to destroy than to sneak past. For example, magical glyphs on the floor that blow up when someone walks near, but can also be disabled with a simple firebolt. Or maybe the castle is protected by guardian golems which can detect any magic in a radius around them. A second way is to give your players a time limit. Sneaking is usually safer, but slower than combat because you need to spend a bunch of time scouting. So by telling your players that the bad guy is running away, that they have already called for reinforcements, that they're about to execute some hostages or get rid of some evidence, or maybe that the lord of the castle will be back in just an hour, you're giving your players a reason to take risks, face danger head on and act like heroes for a change. But what if you want to leave the choice to your players about whether to punch their problems or sneak past them? Well, there's not really a formula for comparing how effective these two different playstyles are. It's more about the perception that your players have. If you see that your players immediately gravitate towards stealth, you can add a time pressure to put combat back into the discussion. And if they immediately go for combat without ever considering stealth for one second, you can have reinforcements show up and tip the scales. Or instead of sticks, you can give your players carrots. If they only consider combat, Promise them an extra reward if they manage to do the mission without raising the alarm. If they only consider stealth, put some loot behind guards in an area that's very difficult to sneak into. So let's say you presented your players with a choice and they did choose to sneak their way to their objective. Now let's figure out how we can make that fun for them. 
There's a couple common pitfalls that people tend to run into when they try to run stealth missions in a game like D&D. First, let's talk about decision making. Now, here's the thing about stealth. Most stealth games are actually designed a bit like puzzle games. Take a look at this room from Mark of the Ninja, for example. When the player reaches that room, they are undetected. So they have all the time in the world to analyze it. Literally, I just stood in that room without moving for 10 minutes just to make a cool time lapse. It's because I'm a cool YouTuber and you should subscribe. Having these safe vantage points lets the player analyze the different elements of the room, come up with a plan, and then execute that plan, just like you would in a puzzle game. But a lot of tabletop RPGs leave it up to the game master to decide things like whether or not an enemy is surprised, when to roll for a stealth check, how far people can hear you when you cast a spell with verbal components, when a guard shouts for help, does that take an action? That sort of approach is great at getting players to improvise. That's the entire reason tabletop RPGs use it. But if a player is trying to come up with a plan, that fuzziness is actually hindering them. It's pretty well known that making plans in D&D is usually a waste of everyone's time, because no plan ever survives contact with the enemy or some other quote from someone smarter than me. But in a stealth segment, you actually want players to make plans. That is the fun part of stealth. So you need a way to make sure that the plans your players come up with mostly survive contact with the enemy, so that your players don't just waste their own time when they discuss what to do. The way to do that is to give your players as much information as you can. For example, when a player tells you what they want to do, don't just ask for a skill check immediately. Instead, tell your players what kind of skill check you're about to ask for, describe what the consequences of failing that skill check are going to be, and then you ask your player do you still want to do that thing? That's information about how you are going to run the game that the player needs to formulate a good plan. But you can also do a couple of things to give the characters more information about the world. For example, don't just get the first castle battle map you find on Google. Instead, make sure your map has some vantage points, which the characters can use to safely gather information about what's ahead of them. Another example. When your players are in the planning phase of a heist or prison escape or something, don't just let them go on endless debates by themselves where every five seconds they come up with a new problem for themselves like, but what if the enemies have guard dogs, so we need a way to hide our sense? Instead, make sure there's an NPC, ally or enemy, who's present in the conversation so that you can interject between two crazy hypotheticals and answer questions that the players might have without having to worry about breaking immersion. Don't just have guards patrolling silently. Make sure they loudly express exactly what they're thinking at the moment. What's that? Must have been the wind. That is called a bark in game design terms. And although Skyrim's execution of it could be improved, that's still information your players can factor into their plans. Once again, stealth missions are a bit like puzzles, so if your players don't have good information, it will feel like you've asked them to solve this puzzle, except you will only reveal the next piece when they've placed the first one. That is not a puzzle game people would ever want to play. A second common pitfall is not accommodating enough of your player's ability. D&D and Pathfinder both feature a stealth skill, a skill called stealth. But if all you ever do in a stealth mission is ask for stealth roles, then only the rogue will get anything to do. To design a puzzle, you always need to start with what can your players do, and D&D has 18 different skills, so that's at least 18 different ways your players might interact with your puzzles. Make sure they get to use some of those tools. Animal handling? Maybe the guards have hounds that can be petted. Arcana? Maybe there's magical runes and the wizard can tell what they do. Persuasion? Maybe the guards can be bribed. And that's just skills, but your players also have a bunch of features from their class. If you have a druid, they might turn into some tiny animal and crawl into tiny cracks in the wall. If you have a sorcerer, they might have spells like a misty step, and those can be used in interesting ways. If you have a monk, they can be sad because they chose to play a monk. What I see most of the time is people going, how could a noble protect their mansion from someone who can teleport? Because this is a fantasy world where people know that teleportation is a thing. So of course they would create countermeasures. That's just your setting being realistic. But what you need is kind of the opposite approach, which is what are interesting obstacles that someone who can teleport might be able to overcome? Maybe they could teleport from one shadow to another to avoid some spotlight. Maybe they can teleport by looking through a keyhole. Maybe there's a ledge that's hard to climb up to, but that's very easy to teleport to. 
Listing what your players can do is always the first step towards building a puzzle. In Cut the Rope, you can cut the rope, while in Hitman, you can hit a man, but also disguise yourself, set up traps, and set up distractions. But Hitman's level designers didn't go, this is a world where there are assassins who can disguise themselves into other people, so of course, they should be retina scanners on every single door. That's just realistic. Instead, they went, what can we do to make Agent 47 as cool as possible? I also want to make sure I mention this. While I am comparing stealth with puzzles in this video, I don't necessarily mean you need to come up with a single solution and then stick to that. There's a bunch of puzzle games, and by extension most stealth games, where there is more than one solution and your performance is rated based on other factors, like how long did it take you to finish the mission, how many times did you get spotted, or how many guards did you have to unalive. Hopefully by now you have a pretty good understanding of the unique challenges of mixing stealth and action in just one game. Now let's build an encounter that will be fun regardless of how the players decide to approach it. This is a red dragon's lair. It has a bunch of fire, gobbled and treasures. My three favorite things in life. If the players successfully sneak in, they might be able to get away with a portion of the dragon's board without ever having to wake the beast up. As I said earlier, players like safety, so they'll have a natural incentive for the stealthy approach here. But they also like money, so they'll have an incentive for the action approach. One unfortunate side effect of how similar stealth and puzzles are is that there's not really a universally accepted framework to build puzzles. If we applied a very formulaic process to building a puzzle, we'd get a very formulaic puzzle. But I'll pull one design technique to use as an example from my hat of design techniques that I could not find ways to make an entire video about, because I think it's a good fit for this situation. There's a narrative structure called the Kisho Tenketsu, which has been used for centuries all over East Asia to write poetry, jokes, comics, and other forms of storytelling. That narrative structure was recently adopted by the lead level designer for modern Mario games, Koichi Hayashida. It goes like this, Ki, the introduction, Sho, the development, and the twist, and gets it, the conclusion. In Koichi Hayashida's works, each stage introduces a mechanic, usually in a safe environment, and it builds upon that mechanic for a while and gives you challenges of increasing and increasing levels of difficulty. Then it gives you a final challenge that forces you to adapt to that mechanic, which at this point you have mastered, but in a new, unexpected context usually by bringing back a mechanic from a previous stage and combining it with the new one. Then the level ends and you're rewarded with a big fancy animation of Mario grabbing a star. The reason I think this is a great fit here is that this framework is designed to teach the players as they go. If you threw a complex stealth puzzles at your players right off the bat, they wouldn't really know how to approach it, because making plans is a skill and they haven't trained it. But here, the introduction and the development serve as a warm-up of sorts. So by the time your players get to the twist, they're on top of things. They know how to make plans, they know what to watch out for. So let's apply it to this dragon's lair. At the entrance, we'll just put two lizard folks and a bell. If the lizard folks ring the bell, they'll call for reinforcements and make things really difficult for the players. But it should be pretty easy to take just those two lizard folks out without giving them a chance to ring that bell. And if your players succeed, they'll get to sneak past the other 10 or so lizard folks without any issue. Regardless of how that first room went, the players then get to the second room, a forge. Here, there's a bunch of kobolds, working under the supervision of some abishai. The kobolds don't exactly enjoy the best treatment, so they'll easily side with the players if given the chance. But it's up to the players to give them that chance. Taking the Abishai out by a surprise is going to be much harder than taking out the lizard folks at the entrance, because now, instead of just two targets to take down simultaneously, they'll have four targets, and they'll have to deal with them while also minding the kobolds. Pulling it off should still be possible, but it will require a good plan and some coordination between your players. After that, the players will get to the vault, where the dragon slumbers. This room is filled with smoke, so it's very difficult to speak or see more than five feet away. There's four statues and they must all be activated at the same time or else it will sound an alarm and catch the attention of some fire elementals who are patrolling the area. So here, just like in the last room, your players have four objectives they need to be completed simultaneously. But the smoke makes communication and coordination much harder. That's our twist. So how are your players going to solve this little puzzle? Well, between their 18 skills, 
35 class features and 55 spells, I'm sure they'll come up with something. That's it for today's video. If you liked this video, make sure you tell YouTube about it by leaving a comment below about how it went the last time you tried to run a stealth mission. And if you want to help even further, you can get new videos two days early by becoming a YouTube member, like these lovely folks who've joined us this month. Michael and the Super Soup, thank you for your support, and until next time, have a good one.